Oh my God. Okay, so uh, things are still going very good. This is this is actually a fairly positive update. There are times whenever a weekend can go really crazy. I so this is going to be the fourth time uh, recording this particular one. This is why it's a little bit late for those of you that watch these. Um, so what what had happened was that I was I don't know why I have I have three pairs of glasses because I lost these originally and then I had a bunch more that I gotten and I had updated my prescription on but they kind of bugged me that's why I was looking really strange I don't even know why you guys needed that information that was that was really weird um so <clears throat> had a whole bunch of ideas and they just flew right out the freaking window um oh I gotta show you guys this so this is my new shirt and this is awesome this is from a place in Stillwater Oklahoma uh yeah Stillwater Oklahoma was that right yeah it was um called Eskimo Joe's and it got started back in the 70s, fantastic burger joint. They're known for their cheese fries that have like bacon and chicken and cheese and stuff on them. They're really good. And they have a sandwich version that I had. Uh, this is what it looked like. Kind of shitty uh, overall color aesthetic, but it was very delicious. Um, and that was mainly the lighting. So, oh my God, um, I'm, I'm a little more energized right now because I'm feeling better. Um, I, I have had... I hate getting migraines and that's something that I just deal with all the time. Part of it is this ridiculous weather. It's just so stupid. Okay. So there's a couple things I was going to cover. The first one was art spaces. And that's something that has always been a real point of interest and contention for me. Maker spaces, creative spaces, anything like that. Here's, here's the lowdown, the real quick rundown of something. And maybe I'll end up making a video essay about this at some point in time. That's something else. I've been trying to come up with our real good evergreen sort of video essays that cover a particular topic in depth. And I want to make sure, though, that those are much better written and not off the cuff kind of things like this with no script or anything else like that. So I think creative spaces can be a really good thing. I really do. Really, really do. I think that they can be a huge boon to the community. I think that they can end up increasing people's perception of what art is, what it takes to make them, and what you end up going through to facilitate having a career, a hobby, selling them in general, presenting them, a bunch of information that most of us, whether we've gone to college or learned it in high school or learned it through trade, may not always know. I know this because I get a lot of questions at every show that I normally will work. Like, how did I get into this? What do you do? I'd like to do this. Oh, I draw or this, whatever, right? And I think that and something like a makerspace could lend itself toward that. The average makerspace, at least from what I've encountered, has usually been something where it's either a subscription or membership-based sort of thing where you can go in and utilize tools. And there are sometimes classes or instructional things that are given to allow people to be able to maybe learn how to use a drill or a router or a 3D printer or certain things like this. I don't always see or have heard of places that will push forward some sort of learning aspect that allows you to go, well, here's what you can do with this further, whether it is to eke out a career in this or just as a hobby, right? There's always this little disconnect that happens in there. And I've been very lucky in my time. Uh, and I think I've shown this relic before, but this is the very first MakerBot piece that I ever destroyed. That, that is plastic, and what looks like this gorgeous HR Giger-like creature coming off of it. This is the, the PLA that melted in this, and this was off a of MakerBot. This part was destroyed, and uh, they were kind enough to let me have it, um, which is really cool. And <laughs> those parts aren't cheap, and uh, I managed to do that. I, I used to print a lot and learn a lot of things, but I always had opportunities, whether it was through work or other places that I'd kind of finagle my way into or figure out how to make things work in in regards to, my cat is gonna get all, no, I gotta, I've gotta, saw a small, small uh, side thing here. I think you guys, anybody that watches these, you know, or if you watch my TikTok, my cat Luna is very much like, no, I've been sleeping in this chair all day. You don't get to have your chair back, this sort of thing. It's one of the reasons why eventually I have to have a bean bag and some other stuff down here because when the cats want to be down here, they have beds, they have all these places, but they want to be where I'm sitting. I would throw money at anybody that invented a chair that had a space for your cat to be almost practically on you, but not on you. 
and I have actually I actually worked on a prototype where it is an office type chair but the the back of the chair well I'm not going to tell all the details on it but basically there are spaces on that chair that are still it, it's not super bulky and it works for having your cat safely around you and they still feel like they're part of your chair of course the easiest thing to do is just go get another chair and try and figure out how to put it in your into your studio or workspace um, so anyway, getting back to the makerspace thing of the few places that I've seen people start them up, <laughs> it's always this idea of building community through art. And I don't understand what that means. No one has ever really been able to give me a good answer for that. I would think it, my take on it is building community through art means truly bringing people into places and giving them practically layman general access to what people do what tools think you know things you know what things are what you know how much does how much does a refill for a marker cost how do you use that refill how do you do things with it i could argue that people would have a better time going to youtube and learning things from here there is a multitude of channels and well-written, well-documented cases covering technology, creative aspects, um, the history of art in a lot of ways, but none that really, really encapsulate how to be an artist without being some sort of clickbaity bullshit like, you know, like, I made $6,000 this month. Follow me and find out what six steps I took to get here, which always end up being fucking bupkis in the end. It, it, I've, I've never really found anyone that fully does that, especially deriving or diving directly into an art career of any kind. It almost always involves teaching classes or other things. And I'm not saying those aren't viable channels to bring stuff in, but I want to talk to the person that is like, well, and, and more and more, I begin to think that maybe that's something I need to do um, because I do have a really unique perspective in being broke as shit often, more often than not, and then struggling to get other things um, created or paid for or done. And that's just the reality. Nobody, nobody really wants to talk about the negative aspect. But if you don't face the negative aspect, you can't build upon the positive aspect. So with most maker spaces, one of the challenges is that they cost money. They're not usually integrated into the community except through things like grants or other problems that arise are, can people afford these classes? There's a bunch of stuff that goes along with it. And I've always felt that there could be a better avenue to go down. Now, if you guys know of any, I'd love to know that. Please leave them below in the comments. That would be phenomenal to find out because I have been trying to do some research into what essentially a makerspace could be and what it could evolve into overall. The challenge is always, and it always is this with the arts in general, right? If you build upon something like this, you usually do have to reach out to not the community, but you have to reach out to a lot of the leadership and figure out what sort of building you have or how these work. Do you have an online presence? Building a team that often, more often than not, isn't paid that well or could be volunteer. I don't like volunteer work. I don't unless it is truly from the heart and it's something they want to do. And I understand that not everything is the most well-funded thing in the world. There are tons of things that need it, but when you're a for-profit aspect, like a larger show, and then all of a sudden your entire staff is like volunteer or you're a makerspace and you're inviting people in to teach a class and the most you do is take them out for dinner. Well, I have problems with that. Pay these people, pay these instructors, value the knowledge they have. And at one point I was involved with a local makerspace that I, Personally, don't think they're doing what they should be doing to incorporate other people and market themselves as effectively as they could. One of the things that always happens with art projects, and I'm talking anything, especially public art access in any real format, is there will always be a lot of red tape. There's going to be a lot of ego involved. And even in the best run ones, that will be a problem. But when I was in Stillwater, there is an art, an art collective there that works through a building that looks, it reminded me a little bit of UCM's, yeah, UCM's art building. And it, it had a lot of open windows and it featured a lot of things. What, I, what really got me was when you walk in, there's two ladies manning the front table and they ask you, what would you like to do today, right? And so there was an art show going on there at the time and, the, and it was put on, 
by this crew that was there. And it was really interesting to see that, you know, people were coming out, a few people came out for the show. A lot of other people came out to, to do what they had there. One of the things they offered was they offered kiln firing. Now, I know that they, it seemed that they went ahead and they also worked with professionals and people that that was their career or that was a big hobby of theirs that would build these pots. But they offered pre-made pots. This is nothing new. I've seen this at other places. And for $10, you could pay. If I remember this price right, I wish I'd gotten more information and talked to more people, but I didn't get a chance to. If you paid $10, you've got a little vessel is maybe about so big, maybe a mug or something like that. And then you pick the glazes and you did it all up. And that was on Friday. And on Saturday, you'd come back and they would have fired it overnight and you had a mug for 10 bucks. That seems cheap. And it is for a handmade item that works that way. Um, the, the thing is, though, is that was bringing people into the world slowly of like what it is to put glaze on something, learning about it getting into that without the whole pressure of like, well, I'll go to hand build this pot, or I've got to try and learn how to work on the, on the potter's wheel and throw clay and all this other stuff and kneading it. This was a quick in, quick out kind of project, and I loved it. They also, the walls were covered. If I have a few photos, I'll be throwing them up here on this or some video or something so you guys can see what I'm talking about. But the walls were covered with multiple classes of different ages of people that the classes ranged from like different sorts of mediums and applications and I loved what they did. They had hand painted frames and then they would just place artwork into the hand painted frames on the wall. And I love that. That's something I'm gonna incorporate in a part of the house eventually um, for a lot of artwork that I have. I'm like, I don't wanna frame this. I'm just gonna draw the frame. And <laughs> the really cool part about this though was looking at it, I was inspired by a lot of this stuff. The, the work was beautiful, right? But I got to see some of these classes happening and I loved what the staff did. They did something that I don't see other places do. It reminded me and sung to the part of my heart that is very much still an elementary teacher for art. Because what happened was um, the, the art show that was happening, the artists and staff could have access to the bathrooms, which is great, air conditioned bathroom. It didn't matter, it was cold as shit that, this past weekend. It was like freezing and really overcast on Saturday. Uh, so you could go in and you could use the restroom. And when I did, I always took the opportunity to walk through there and just kind of see, and it was a big open space. As you can see, they had tables and all this other stuff set up. And I didn't take any video of the classes happening because it was a lot of kids, but it was really interesting to see the staff members working with them. And they had like eight or nine people that were working with these classes and working through people's projects. And they were helping them do, you know, like little bits of paper mache and drawing and painting with tempera and all these things. But they were really pulling the teachers inward, uh, or no, I'm not the teachers, I'm sorry. The teachers were pulling the adults, the parents, the guardians, whoever it was that came with the kid, they were pulling them into the project. And it was phenomenal, it was freaking great. What they would do is, is exactly like what I'm saying. Somebody would be sitting down and you can see the parents kind of watching. And it's like, have you ever been to any of these places where a, a Legoland strikes my fancy on that a lot, you know, I would always go to the adult nights, right? Where they would have like, it's just, you know, me and my brother used to do that all the time and everything. But I would talk to a lot of the people there and they'd be like, you know, we enjoy, <laughs> the staff would often enjoy the adult night a little bit more because yeah, sometimes you have to deal with some strange adults, but it, it was interesting and a different dynamic than when you'd have parents who would go there and be bored out of their minds while their kids are running around playing with Lego. And I often think to myself, it's a shame when we let aspects of things that we love die within us, when we, we don't pay attention to that inner child when we don't reach out to that person that still lives within us. Um, I, I have a lot of love and care for that version of me that is still eight, nine, 13 years old, whatever. There are aspects like that. In fact, I can talk to that here in just a moment. I actually found uh, this really cool ship that I've been looking for from Captain Power. My brother found it and then I went and picked it up and I was really excited for it. This is, this is Lord Dredd's ship from the Captain Power series. It's not complete. And it's a little dirty, but it's going up on my ceiling here in the studio very soon. And I'm very happy for that. Now, that show came out 30 plus years ago or whatever. I hate to think about that. But the point is, now that I'm an adult, now that I am an adult and I have the money that I can do whatever the fuck I want with, getting something like that, and it was 20 bucks, is not that bad. And it's something that fuels my own um, internal flame of creativity and keeps me relevant in the world of art for myself for what I draw. What they were doing with parents 
was in a similar facet, except it wasn't about anything having to do with pop culture's 80, you know, pop, 80s pop culture. I swear to God, I'm talking and I have like flippy flip of the words. <laughs> what they were doing was they, you know, I could see, like I watched for a little bit. Um, just kind of looking around. I didn't want to be intrusive, but there was one guy, one dad that was kind of standing over to the side, just looking. And the lady that was doing it was like, hey, you know, if you want to come over here and do your own piece, oh, no, no, I, I, I'm not that good of an artist. And she's like, none of us really are. He said, well, I mean, you know how to use a paint. She's like, right, somebody showed me. Come on, sit over here, sit over here. And she, sl she gently guided him over to sit down. I wasn't forceful. It wasn't anything like that. It was simply, come over here and play. Sit down and bond his daughter was jamming on this stuff she was like bah, 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 just going nuts right she's having the time of her life when her dad sat down you could see the the the, the switch click it was wonderful and i went to use the restroom wandered around the back part of the building to look at another class came back and he was really into it he was sharing crayons with her and she's like daddy what is your favorite color and He's coloring. He's like, well, I'm actually coloring with her. I love blue. And she's like, you wear a lot of blue. And he goes, I do. I, I always love it. I love blue jeans. I love this. Just hearing the conversation. They were right toward the edge. And often in education or in just different creative spaces that I've been in, you can be privy to some really wonderful conversations that will happen between parents and kids. Sometimes they're not always great. <laughs> but that's a whole, nother, a whole nother thing. It's just a memory that popped into my head. But most of the time you can see something like that and it's just, it's just, you know, soup for the soul. It's wonderful. And it made me think like, that is something that I don't see pushed. A lot of times I think that any investment like a creative space, a maker space, you are trying to make your money back. And we live in a capitalistic society and there's a lot to say about, I got to pay for the bills. I got to do this. There's only so many grants I can get and all these other things. I get that. I really do. But I also think that there needs to be a healthy enough reach to market these places so that that way you truly are building back into the community. So many places that are run don't seem to be run by the artists. They seem to be run by a board or people that have an interest in art, or they're more concerned with the idea of building something that will make their living area safer or more prolific for the mindset that they wanna be in. And I don't blame them. The world is kind of a freaky, weird, scary place. It really is. But at the same time, building up walls, proverbial, metaphorical, whatever, or physical in some cases, does not protect us. It doesn't. It allows for stagnation. It allows for a veneer of, of growth and prosperity. But it isn't the real thing. There are so many people I've met through different jobs and through schools I've taught at that sometimes they just need that leg up. Sometimes they just need that help. Fuck, I'm not ashamed. I'm in that boat a lot of times. Kinda am now. Now, I don't take in charity. I'll never ask for donations. In fact, I don't run a Patreon or do anything like that. At some point in time, I'll, you know, make sales again on my site and stuff like that, and, that, and I'll get back to shows. But that's how I plan on growing my stuff. When you're a makerspace, there is a lot of things you have to develop to be able to become financially well off. Some probably lose a lot of money and maybe a, a money pit, honestly. But I honestly think that if that's the case and what you're having to go through, why wouldn't you want to grow it in a way that allows for people within the community, people that may have never gotten a chance to do art, creative things of any level, go out and do something that will maybe light that flame. Maybe they hate it, right? I've talked to people that have done wine and paint parties, which personally to me is kind of the bottom barrel scraping shit of art, but whatever. Um, that will say, man, this is really hard. No shit. No shit. You know, you may see something interesting and cool that you see, but if you don't have some knowledge of how to utilize a razor blade or a a, a brush, it, you know, or even a pencil in, you know, aside from taking notes. Yeah, it's going to be a little bit of a struggle, but it doesn't mean it's impossible. One of my favorite metaphors is that the guitar is one of the easiest instruments 
to pick up and strum a three bar chord on or something like that, right? But the moment it's, it, the guitar is one of the easiest ones to pick up and play, but it is absolutely one of the hardest to master. But that doesn't mean that you can't take them and use them in a way that you hadn't really thought about before. Hello, Radar. It, that you couldn't take them and utilize them the way you want. Maybe you play a little bit of percussive aspect on it. Maybe you pluck them in your own way. There's, a, there's no right way to play an instrument. There are better ways, possibly. I don't know. It's a, ma it's a matter of opinion, you know? If you're making something with it that is acceptable to somebody or enjoyable, then you're maybe doing good. If you enjoy it, that's all that needs to happen. But with a lot of maker spaces, there can be the whole issue of like, well, how do we how do we make money? How do we grow from here? How do we promote? What do we do? And we have to be honest with ourselves if you want to start something like that. Know your limitations. Know what you don't understand. And don't just hope that word of mouth is going to grow something like that. It doesn't work that way, especially not today. From social media to other physical things happening in this world, there is so much vying for your attention that something like this could easily be lost. One of the best things at Hallmark that ever happened was that they had an area called Leap Lab. Now, last I heard, they shut that down because the fellow that I knew that was running it was gone. Um, he got let go just before I did. And when I think about the loss that happened with that, you know, when all that changed and it basically came, it basically became this whole circumstance where, can you please climb down? You're making me nervous. Like, I'm scared you're going to knock something down, sir. Poof. Um, whenever I think about what I learned in that place, right? And there was a multitude of classes I didn't get a chance to take. And I recall, and this is very true. I have emails covering this. They had it. And certain places within the company were allowed to look, to look into it and do stuff. I kind of bucked the trend and went ahead and did what I wanted because I wanted to. But there was always kind of, if you didn't have a manager that really appreciated what you were trying to do, they, no, just spend your time doing this. The light lab was supposed to be there so that people could go and learn how to use the laser cutters and 3D printers and other stuff. And I worked out basically where I was coming in a little bit before work and then during my lunch period and then again after work, I would design stuff and work on things and print stuff out and figure out how to work on things because I wanted to be actively part of this community. I watched it basically get folded and it was not fun. It was not cool. It seemed like this was one creative aspect that could have brought a bunch of people together and would have allowed for a lot more innovation. But sometimes within the corporate sector, there's only a fair few that will ever be allowed to do uh, the thinking and creating and they'll, they'll kind of put them up, you know, they're almost like crown jewels. And then you'll have a lot of other people that may have good ideas and they're never really listened to. And that is the exact sort of thing that I see manifest with a lot of creative space, maker space sort of things that will happen. It is a small group of people that will usually call the shots who normally in most ways have no real creative aspect on their own. Or even if they do, they're kind of walking around with shutters on their eyes. You know, they're, they're very focused on what they know and what moves forward and anything beyond that there might be ego, there might be insecurity, there might be a, a, a bit of worry that, well, well if I, but if I don't, if I look like I don't know what I'm doing, this could cost me my job. This is really cush. This is really, this is my bread and butter. Hey, no kidding. But what about the people that don't have the money or don't have the access, or maybe because they've never really been invited or they've never heard of it, will never partake in it. Then isn't that counterproductive to the idea of community through art? It, it's a question I ask myself all the time. Anyway, that was the main big thing I wanted to talk about. I don't have answers. I know that someday I really would like to go ahead and get something like that started in the local scene. I look at it more and more, but I know that I'm probably a good three to five years off before I can really do anything. The amount of money and time that it's going to take to invest in something like that and try and stay away from a lot of uh, red tape that could pop up with stuff like that because one of the things that I have grown to understand is when you create public art or you do something that looks good for the community but it is outside of somebody's wheelhouse of understanding that does not mean that you will not have local politicians and or other representatives or local celebrities showing up 
wearing nice clothing and standing next to you for a photo op with a golden shovel or some bullshit like that. They'll do it. And sometimes that's kind of the thing you have to eat with it. It doesn't mean that in the long run, when the chips are down, that you can't aim for helping the community and hopefully the community will help you back. It's kind of an idea that I have. I may lose a lot in that process, but you know, we don't grow without taking risks. And that's really kind of the big thing at the end of this. So uh, yeah, so on to other real quick updates. My dog Penny is doing extremely well. Um, I've recorded this so many times that I think I've posted about this, but I haven't. Uh, they managed to get a clean cut around her little cyst-like tumor. Uh, there were three grades, grade one, two, and three. Did not want two or three because two was going to require steroids and treatment, and three was going to require chemotherapy. On a tiny little eight to ten pound dog, not great. Uh, she had a one and a very low grade one. So knock on wood, that's taken care of. It was excised. She's doing fine in the process though, with a while they were intubating her to knock her out. They found a weird growth on her tongue. And I, I was originally going to post the photo, but I'm like, I know some people are going to be squeamish about that. My vet sends me photos of things that are going on. Um, my other dog that lives in my parents' house, uh, he had a massive tumor, like a huge one. And I'm talking, it looked like a side of beef and it was removed. And I'm glad that he did that because it was so bad that it was it was removing the, the bone out of the socket the way it was growing. And the first idiot veterinarian that my parents had taken um, my dog to at that point said, no, we have to remove the leg. It was insane. Always get a second fucking opinion, especially when it comes to your health and your animal's health. Just go get another opinion because there's a multitude of morons in the medical field, a ton of them. But the vet that I have right now, Dr. Schrock is freaking amazing and he did a wonderful job so she's doing well she's on the bench she's got like a real mean looking street level you know uh nine stitches across here and they cauterized the little uh growth that was on her tongue it what it was was just something had cut her tongue at some point and it created an excess of scar tissue and so that had to be cut out um she didn't grow back anything else like that that's all it was both of them got sent up for biopsies and that's how the whole thing got cleared so really good news on that very very happy about that um, what else? I have no more updates to really talk about as far as shows or anything. I still have not finished getting around to getting my shit ready for Twitch. I apologize for that. I keep talking about it. I swear to God, I'm going to keep saying it until I finally get on there. And you guys, if you want to follow me on there, you can. I do have a Twitch channel set up. I just have no content on there. And honestly, it's just getting either some games or some artwork or something ready to do for that. I have been catching up here on YouTube, posting a lot of other older bits of artwork and stuff. So there was that. Oh, if you follow me on TikTok, you've seen this. So when I was in Stillwater, I also got to see two giant Transformer sculptures that were just amazing. They were great. They were fantastic. Each one was like over 22 feet tall, something like that. They're just they're huge and they're wonderful and they were great. Um, but I also, this is a weird thing. So I'm going to end on this because I think, yes, I did a TikTok book review on this. And this was before I had started the book review series that I haven't added any more content to yet here on YouTube, but I'm going to redo one of them. So there was a TikTok I did on a an official book put out about Banksy, the graffiti artist. I have been a fan of his for a long time. I didn't know a lot about most of the stuff. I just, and whenever I saw something from him, I'm like, that's my man. That's the shit. That's really cool. And so there was, this was really weird. It was an unauthorized very unauthorized show and Banksy addresses this if you go to his website you can see he's addressing these shows um, I did not pay to go to this show it was an opportunity to go to the show so I was grateful and I went with it um, and I did want to go but then I thought to myself wait is this official this is really weird and then the more I found out I was like oh no none of this money goes to him he doesn't earn a goddamn dime off of it what it was was a collection of well here's some footage that you can take a look at it's a collection of some some footage that was projected which was interesting uh some had been animated and a few originals that were in private collections ranging from places in europe to la to new york and everywhere in between it was really cool i thought it was a really cool aspect they this one was actually very well done i know with the van gogh like immersive experience it was a lot of projection in a room and it wasn't bad I mean, for what it was, if you really like Van Gogh, it was a nice experience. But I always think that these are things that, like, I'm like, you could charge five bucks and that's it. You don't really have to charge that much. But, hey, capitalism and wanting to, you know, live off of artists without 
um, paying them. This cat's going to drive me nuts. I know he's going to jump up in the window here in a second. Um, so anyway, the show was pretty good uh, as far as it can be for an unauthorized sort of thing. I enjoyed it for what it was. And I thought that I was like, you know, there's a lot of these here that they evidently were originals. I was looking at them like, holy shit, they've actually got real things in here. And it was really cool to see this. But it also kind of left a bad taste in my mouth because I know he's spoken out about so many of them. And I, this one, Banksy Land, was not on his list on his website. This is a fairly new one. But he had about another 10 or so, more than that, I think, that he was like, you know, do, treat these accordingly. Don't, don't fucking go to these things. And, but this one at least explained a lot more about him. There did seem to be a small modicum of respect. I don't even know if that's the word. Maybe some coins tossed her toward him as far as the verbiage and all this other stuff, but they certainly had a gift shop with, you know, posters and screen printed things. It was really weird. And the whole thing I kept thinking to myself was like, well, it is what it is. And, you know, I'm going to enjoy it for what it's worth. Would I ever go to one like that again? No, no, I wouldn't. I'd much rather just see his work in public. And, you know, he's been known to do things like that. At one point in time, he did a pop up in New York where he was selling, you know, uh, spray painted canvases for 60 bucks. I think he had 50 of them total in that run. It was a one time pop up. It happened like a few years ago. I'm not saying that when I travel, I may not run across something from Banksy and get a photo with it or something else like that. I mean, that I'd be fine with that. He is a, a crazy prolific and just amazing. His visuals are amazingly powerful. And I'm grateful that I live at a time where Banksy is alive and I can appreciate that stuff. But that's a whole nother thing, a whole nother discussion I'd like to get into at some point in time when I learn far more about Banksy and his history after reading that book and um, talking about what our legacies are and what it means when we take something in personal collections and we showcase it or we profit off of it and the artist doesn't see a thing. So maybe that would be something you could learn about at any one of these uh, centers, you know, these creative maker spaces. I don't know. Anyway, thanks for watching guys. You can catch me on all the different kinds of social media out there until the government decides to ban them. And you can also, let me see here. You, oh, you can just literally just type in the artisan rogue, either with no spaces or spaces and you'll find me. Google is ranking me pretty high on people named artisan rogue. And aside from that, I will have some more updates this next week. I, I don't even have an excuse for this aside from the fact that migraines suck and my allergies are terrible. And, uh, yeah. And I also, I didn't, I wasn't able to record this earlier. My, my neighbor has this whistle and I, he's just such a weird guy. And he just kept blowing the whistle all day. And I was like, I'm not going to record this. And people hearing like a goddamn whistle, like just, it wasn't even a dog whistle, you know, where it's silent and hurts my dog's ears. It was like this loud, like the kind you give somebody on a train for no reason. Like that kind of a thing. It was horrible. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Now I'm going to get to doing my other shit. So thanks for watching, guys. I'll catch you next week in another journal entry.